Hi, Virginia. Good to meet you. Hi, Marcus. Never, how are you? We've never actually met before, have we? No. So, uh, everyone, this is Virginia San Raffello from uh, California Architecture Studio Rail San Fratello. She's our guest today on Screen Time, our series of architecture live interviews sponsored by Enscape. Um, Virginia, tell us a little bit about your setup there. Where are you and how are things where you are in the world right now? I am in Oakland, California, Marcus, and we are still sheltering in place here. So things are, are quiet. You know, most of the, the stores are still closed. Uh, one nice thing that Oakland has done is to close off some of the streets so that people could run and walk and bicycle. And so that's been a nice uh, thing that's emerged out of this. So that's, that's what we're doing here. We're still laying low. I've never been to Oakland, but I can imagine it's usually quite a car dominated place. Would that be fair to say? So all of this running and cycling and walking, is that a, quite a change from the usual traffic or have I got the completely the wrong um, cliched impression of what the Valley's like? Well, it, this is California. So sure, it's a car dominated <laughs> environment. And I think it's also a place where people go to the gym a lot. But now people are are outside, you know, doing all the, the things that we do and in, in trying to make it work. So we're not in our cars, we're not in our trains or planes or gyms. We're all out here together using the city as our living room. <laughs> and do you think that that might continue after the pandemic's eased off? Are there, are there movements? There's definitely movements in European cities to try and retain this kind of sense of space and, and quiet that has been one of the, the one of the few positive side effects of the, the lockdown. You know, I think that would be good. And I can imagine that people here would be quite vocal about that and advocate for it. Um, you know, that our city should be for us and not for our cars only. And, you know, there are maybe hopefully some good things that come out on the other side of this. And that could definitely be one of them. Yes. We can, I mean, I can feel it. I don't need to read that we have less pollution. I can feel it. It's tangible. Yeah. And you've been through a lot out there. I, I guess, are you in the, the part of California that was affected by the smoke from the wildfires? I mean, there's really been a, you've had a tough time of it out there, haven't you? We were, that was in the fall of 2018, the campfire and the smoke came down and settled here over the San Francisco Bay underneath the fog. And so we were trapped in it for a month. I think we had the worst air quality in the world for almost a month, yeah. You're doubly enjoying the good air quality at the moment then. Exactly. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your studio, Real San Fratello. Tell us about um, the team and the kind of projects that you do and then how you started out. Hmm. Well, Rail San Fratello is comprised of my partner, Ronald Rael, and myself. And we could scale up and down depending on the projects that we're doing. We use Rail San Fratello as, I think, largely a, a think tank. And we look at social and cultural and political issues through the lens of architecture. And we try to use the, the designs that we create and build as a way uh, to comment on things. In some cases, like uh, the teeter-totter, which we built between the United States and Mexico, is commentary on the relationship between the two countries. Um, we did a project at the Berkeley Botanical Gardens, which used glass rods from the bankrupt company Solyndra <laughs> that speaks to what, what is a contemporary local material, or how do we use waste materials in our 21st century world. What is the new vernacular, for example? So we're we're kind of poking <laughs> and disrupting and intervening in different systems through the the designs that we propose and make. We also have another. Gonna... Company. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, carry on. You also have what? Another company? Did you say? We have a, we have another company. We we're starting to be a company that makes companies as well. So we have another company called Emerging Objects, which started as a Rael San Fratello project, 
that is a make tank and we develop materials for 3D printing and we are using those materials to make interiors and to make architecture. Okay, and hopefully you're gonna talk about both sides of what you do in your presentation, which you're about to give us. Yes. Do you wanna take it away then? Sure. Okay, can you see that? Yeah. Great. So as I mentioned, I'm a partner in Rael Senfratello and Emerging Objects. Um, I'll just start with Emerging Objects. As I mentioned, we're a make tank. Um, we have spent the last 10 years developing materials for 3D printing. And we started doing this because uh, we wanted to 3D print some designs for an exhibit that we were working on. And we sent our digital models out to a company to have them printed. And, and the price came back as $5,000 for this one tiny piece. So we decided to buy our own secondhand printer to hack it and to use our own materials in the printer. So we've been printing with uh, local materials such as salt, which you can see on the left side of the image, which is harvested here in the San Francisco Bay. We print with cement. This is the most widely used material in the world for construction, but we have transformed it for additive manufacturing. We print with materials that are in the waste stream, such as sawdust, which you can see here in the third image, and mud and clay to make ceramics. And we're using these to make objects, blocks, tiles for interiors and architecture. One of the first materials that we started printing with was coffee. Of course, this is a material that we all have in our homes. I have a cup of coffee every morning and I was sitting at my kitchen table one day thinking, I wonder if I could print with this. And I did a little research and found out that, of course, the coffee bean is harvested and roasted and goes on to become what flavors your coffee in the morning. But there's a, a fruit, a cherry around the bean that is an agricultural waste product that's left in the field to rot. And we were able to partner with a company that takes the fruit and dehydrates it and pulverizes it and makes a caffeinated flour for baking. And we can 3D print with that coffee fruit, which you can see here in this 3D printed coffee coffee cup. We were also able to successfully 3D print with our own coffee grounds, which we've recycled and dried and pulverized in a coffee grinder <laughs> and then put in our uh, 3D printer, which you can see here in this coffee coffee pot. Other materials like sugar, which are inherently soluble and sticky are great for 3D printing. And we've printed these spoons in volumes that correspond to one teaspoon, two teaspoons, one tablespoon and beyond. And you can stir down your 3D printed sugar spoon into your coffee cup in the morning. And we're able to print with other uh, edible materials. This is the furry curry casserole dish and it's made out of the different spices that you would find in curry like turmeric and cumin. And this dish has been polymerized on the exterior, so it's waterproof and strong, but we left it unfinished on the interior so that if you put rice or noodles or something in the dish, it would literally season the food. And my favorite thing about this piece is how aromatic it is. Even after several years, it's still really fragrant. And we're using these materials that we've invented on buildings. This is the cabin of 3D printed curiosities. It is in fact where I am now. <laughs> and we have used the materials to make the planter tiles on the front facade. So if you look closely, you'll see, uh, I think there's around 500 tiles here that hold succulents, which thrive in our Northern California environment. And the dark brown tiles are 3D printed out of Chardonnay grape skins from close by Sonoma. And the light gray tiles are cement and the light brown tiles are 3D printed sawdust from local uh, furniture manufacturers. This is just a waste product. And we've been watching these tiles and observing how they weather, how these materials weather and transform and change. 
in the atmosphere and our climate here. And the roof and the east and west facades are 3D printing using local clays here from California. And we use a software called Potterware that we developed to design these. And they have kind of loopy uh, knitted texture, so they appear to be soft, but of course they're not. They're very strong and durable and they will last thousands of years. And we've continued more recently to 3D print with clay and we're also printing with mud. Uh, this is a photograph from uh, a project that we started last year called Mud Frontiers. And we call it Mud Frontiers because we are 3D printing with mud, literally the ground right beneath your feet. But we're also printing at the frontier, in this case, the historical frontier between the United States and Mexico. And this project for us is about mobility. We're using a lightweight robotic arm for printing. It's about ubiquity. We're using local free materials that you can dig from the ground and democracy because we're trying to break through this barrier that prevents people mostly for financial reasons from accessing this technology. So the robot is considerably less expensive than an industrial robot. The materials are free. And again, we're using a software app that runs in the cloud. It's really easy to use. So you don't have to know how to 3D model anything to print using this technique. So here you can see the, the lightweight robotic setup and the mud is being pumped through this hose into this Pacelli type structure, which is the foundation for this 3D printed stair, which is quite strong. And we've also printed this hearth and we use the same technique, a kind of wiggly Pizzelli structure to support the bench, which is on the interior of this structure. And then there is a thin wall that goes up to create an enclosure to protect the hearth from the wind. And we've inserted these juniper sticks into that thin wall to help structure it. But it also makes it look furry, which I think is what I like most about it. And here's the interior. So you can see that 3D printed mud bench the hearth and the coils of the earth as they make up the texture of this interior. And we've taken this robotic setup uh, to other places as well. Here we are literally on the frontier. We're printing on a mesa in uh, El Paso. And in the background, you can see Juarez. And if you look closely in the upper right hand side of the screen, you see the border wall between the United States and Mexico. And these are some early tests where we were trying to figure out the best mix, the best ratios of clay and sand and chopped straw and water for a project called Future Ruins. And while we were there, we worked with students from the University of Texas, El Paso. They went out into the landscape in New Mexico, Texas and Chihuahua to search for clays that we could 3D print with. And we call these wild clays. So they're not clay bodies that we're purchasing. And they discovered this, this kind of beautiful collection and complexion of clay in the region, which we thought was so lovely and so representative of the culture there. And the students were very quickly within a week to uh, collect this clay, to 3D print these ceramic vessels using different textures and using the software and the 3D printer that we provided them. And these were students who had never modeled anything in the computer before. They had never taken a ceramics class before. And they were suddenly able to make these hundreds of, of really beautiful objects. And here you can see them at the Rubin Center for Visual Art alongside the 3D printed Adobe enclosure that Ronald and I made. We've been working at the border between the United States and Mexico for probably 10 years. And the border wall between the United States and Mexico is approximately 800 miles long. The actual border is almost 2000 miles, just to give you a sense of how much has been built since George W. Bush passed the Secure Fence Act in 2006. And we've worked hard to kind of smuggle in design at the border, which you can see here in this proposal for a teeter-totter. And our designs are often commentary on how people have reacted to this wall over the years. Last year, 
last July, we were able to slip our teeter-totters through the border between Anapra and Sunland Park, New Mexico to ride the border between the United States and Mexico. And we had the opportunity to spend time with the families that live on the Mexican side of this border and to share in our common humanity. The people who live here are affected by the horror of this wall every day. This is their backyard. Can you imagine having this in your backyard? And for 40 minutes, we were able to show the world that play can be an act of resistance. And the wall became a literal fulcrum for US-Mexico relations. Children and adults were connected in meaningful ways. But the recognition that actions that take place on one side have a direct consequence on the other. And for this, this was an opportunity to start to break down this barrier and to bring people together. So that's a little Great. overview of some of the projects that we've been working on. Great, and I remember when we published the the, the seesaws, as we call them, what did you call them? Teeter totters. Teeter totters, <laughs> yeah. I've never heard that word before. Is that like an Americanism? Maybe. <laughs> it was one of the most popular projects at the time that we published. But um, you, you talked about trying to smuggle in design to the, the border wall. So was that a was that a kind of guerrilla project? You didn't ask permission or anything like that. You just went and did it. It was a guerrilla project. We we asked permission a couple of times in different places and we could never get permission. No one would, no one was willing to support us, the border patrol or, or any local municipalities. So yeah, we ended up just saying, well, we're gonna do it because we think it's important. And so we did. And did you need help on the other side of the border? Were you able to install these teeter totters from one side or did you have people around the other side as well helping you out? So we chose a, a site that we were familiar with. It's called Anapra. And it's a place where families live really close to the border. I mean, the, right now at that location, the United States extends three feet on the Mexican side of the border. And then these houses, this neighborhood community starts. And so there are a lot of families who are there. There are a lot of children who are already there already. And we felt like there would be a presence there and the children would come out and play because they always come to the fence and talk to you. Um, but the way we structured it was that my partner, Ronald, went to Juarez and picked up the teeter-totters with some friends and brought them to the border. And they very quickly, we designed it so that you could very quickly slide the, the, the vertical, I'm sorry, the horizontal parts in between the fence. And then I with some friends came from the US side with the seats and the handlebars and we put them in really quickly. And we could see the border patrol up on the mesa. So we knew they could see us and we knew they would come quickly and we didn't know what they would do. So our plan was to be able to, to play for five to seven minutes before the border patrol showed up. And how long did it take them to show up? Five to seven minutes, <laughs> they showed up. And right on cue. Right on cue. Oh. But they were, they, they got it. They, they said, uh, you know, we went over and talked to them and, and we told them what we were doing and they were like, it's fine, keep on doing it. You're not doing anything wrong. Uh, and, and they stayed there the whole time and watched. But um, I think they recognized that, you know, we were coming together to play. We were enjoying each other's company. We were, mostly women and children, which I thought was interesting and not something that I necessarily anticipated. And so I, I think there was a lot of joy there. And I think they recognized that. And so how long did the seesaws remain in place? Did somebody then take them away or are they still there? What, what, what was, was there a legacy of the project? So it is illegal to attach anything permanently to the border wall. So we played for about 40 minutes and then, you know, people started getting a little bit tired and we, um, we took them down, that's it. And took them back uh, to Juarez and they're gone. 
they will be at the National Building Museum in Washington, DC sometime when things open up again. And we want to give people a chance to play and ride them there as well. So they can have a little bit of a continued life. And this is a, probably a stupid question because even if there is an answer, you're hardly going to tell me, but do you have any plans to do anything else like that? <laughs> you know, we do and we, we, uh, we sketch out different ideas for different projects um, that we could kind of keep pounding on the border <laughs> in a way to, to, I think, expose the harsh reality of, of what is there. Um, and I think what's important for us is, is to just show the faces of the people who live there. You know, there, um, there is this myth that the people crossing the border are bad men. But the reality is the people who live there are families, you know, just like you and me, and they cross the border to go see their relatives every day. You know, the, these are families that have been there for generations and the border crossed them and divided them. Like they were there first. These are people who cross the border to go to work every day or to take their children to school. And I think we, we wanna show the reality of it. And so I think we will continue doing things, but yes, we won't tell you exactly when and where because yeah. <laughs> Kind of blow the project out of the water, wouldn't it? To tell a journalist of all people. But um, you, a lot of your, you've done quite a lot of work and research around border conditions. Tell us a little bit about the, the other projects and, and the kind of research work that you've done around these scenarios. Well, my partner Ronald wrote a book called Border Wall is Architecture. And he has a number of vignettes in there that look at things which have been happening there. So for example, people play a volleyball across the border wall and the border wall is a kind of a tractor that brings people together. And uh, there's, a, there's a, a binational volleyball game that takes place every year. Um, people come to the border to do yoga together. Uh, we've looked at uh, the different kinds of opportunities, kind of infrastructural opportunities that could exist there. For example, several years ago, we were working on a proposal to put a solar farm there because it's one of the sunniest places in the United States and Mexico. And we could use the, the border wall to literally provide power and electricity to cities on both sides of the border so that it could be useful if it has to be there. But of course, the reality is we don't advocate for the wall at all. We would like to see it gone. Yeah. And, and um, do you also design sort of houses and office buildings and stuff like that? Do, 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 is there a kind of more conventional side to your architecture? And, or is it are these kind of provocative products, experimental projects, that's the thing that you do? Like, you, you teach as well, I, I think, but... Um, Tell us a little bit about, um, is there a more, a more kind of normal, should I say, aspect to what you do? Like, a, a, is, is your studio a business or is it just like a, a, an art project? It's, it's not a, a lucrative business, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm here in the cabin. This is one of the most normal buildings that we've made where everything is 3D printed. Um, you, you know, the, the walls, the, all of the objects behind me, the furniture, even the cup, right? It's a total work of art. Um, we have, we actually did uh, design and build a house in Marfa, Texas some years ago. And that's, I think one of the, and we also designed, we were the architects for Prada Marfa, which is in Valentine, Texas. So those are two normal buildings. Uh, and they're, they're there right next to the border. And, and it was spending time designing on and working on those projects, which opened our eyes to the reality of that region. Yeah. I saw the Prada store on your, on your website. How did that project come about? Because that is also, although it's a, you know, physically a, a, a real store, it's also a provocation, isn't it? To design a luxury um, clothing store in the middle of the desert. So how did that whole collaboration come about? Well, it, it's not a real store. It's a, it's a land art installation. And uh, it was conceived of by the artist Elm Green and Dragset. And they originally wanted to make 
an installation called Prada Nevada and they would have it out in the Nevada desert somewhere. But I think they were able to find uh, support for it in Marfa uh, through the ballroom. And uh, Ronald and I were there in Marfa working on this adobe house that we built in, in within the downtown. And um, we ran into someone who worked at, at ballroom and he said, hey, you know, we need an architect for this project. And he showed us the renderings and we were like, oh yes, of course we have to do this. This looks amazing. Um, and there was only a rendering, it was only a drawing of the elevation and it was white. And we thought, wouldn't it be amazing to make this out of Adobe? And we even went in search of white Adobes. We heard this rumor that someone down in Mexico along the river was making white Adobes. Um, and we found him, the white Adobes were not quite white enough. So in the end, we used more traditional uh, stabilized Adobes from New Mexico that are brown and we stuccoed the wall, but we didn't put the metal lath in between the stucco and the mud with the hope that one day when the stucco falls off, the mud would be exposed and the building would just melt back into the ground, like all of the traditional buildings have done there for thousands of years. And the 3D printing projects that you showed earlier, again, it's like it's very experimental, experimenting with different types of material and so on and so forth. But do, do you see that as research as having kind of an end point? Is, there, is it building up towards being able to, 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 to build on some kind of scale with those kind of printing? Or do you just enjoy the experimentation? No, I think, I think it all has an application and an end point. I mean, we're, we've built, let's say conventional houses and buildings out of Adobe. And now we're 3D printing with mud and Adobe with the goal, I think ultimately of being able to 3D print an Adobe house that you could really live in. And the other materials, so the cabin here is a, is a test case for the Chardonnay and the, the sawdust. Um, and we are partnering with uh, someone else who has a lot of experience in 3D printing and we've developed a company called Forest and we're trying to commercialize the 3D printed sawdust because over the years, this is the material that people have responded to the most. People, I think, are really excited about using this waste material that would otherwise go to landfill to make really beautiful blocks and tiles like what you can see behind me here for screens and cladding for interiors. So I think, and we think it would be desirable of this research could make it out into the world and more people could have access to it and experience it in a very useful and functional way. And you've made all of those projects just by getting hold of um, existing 3D printers and hacking them basically, have you, including the larger scale architectural projects? So we started by hacking our printers, you know, modifying them and putting our own materials in. And the robotic arm, which I showed in the Mud Frontiers project, is a, a printer or a robot that we actually had designed for this purpose. You had that. You so had that. we're starting to make our own machines and our own software now. So is that so? You you said that you wanted to make a, an Adobe house. Is do you have a? Have you started working on that? Is there a is there a real plan to to do that? There's a plan this summer to take this further. So we've been experimenting with 3D printing vaults and domes to try to close it up. But we also recognize that this material, you know, it erodes in, in the rain, right? It melts away. So it would have to be protected by a roof. So we've started thinking about what the design of this, this building would be. And um, the fire, the, the building with the hearth in the center that you showed that had the juniper sticks sticking out, mm -hmm even though you've used a, a very uh, contemporary technique, the building looks absolutely ancient, doesn't it? It looks like those mosques in places like Senegal and, and Mali, where they have the, the adobe walls with the, the bits of wood presumably sticking out to provide rigidity and to allow people to climb up and fix them. Is, that, is, uh, mm -hmm. is there a, a, how do you feel about that paradox of working with sophisticated modern machines, but producing something that looks exactly the same as something that's, a couple of thousand years old. Well, I like it. I think sometimes we have to look back to look forward. And, you know, I think that um, 
those those sticks are scaffolding at the mosque in Janae so that the workers can climb up on the building and replaster it every year. So they're functional. And it's not, it's not like we're trying to copy something that's decorative. In our case, they're they're useful and functional as well. And I think it's it's fine to keep that. And do you think there could be a, a serious use for a 3D printing with mud? I mean, could it have the potential to house large numbers of people or to provide, you know, healthier living conditions? Do, does it have a place in the contemporary world as a, as a viable architectural construction technique, do you think? Yes, I do. I think it, it does. It's, it's fast. You know, we printed each of those structures in, I think the hearth was printed in less than a week. So it's faster than um, working by hand. And I think, you know, we live in a society where people don't spend their time repairing their house because we have to work, right? Because we live in a society where we need money to survive. And so this uh, reduces the amount of time to make these structures. You know, earth is a building material. Um, and as a thermal mass is better than concrete in many regions of the world, it would it would provide you know, cooler interiors in the summer and warmer interiors in the winter. Uh, it's free. Like why import cement? Why ship cement and concrete around the world when you have a perfectly suitable building material right there? Right. We have a couple of questions from our online audience, and the first one is one I was going to ask you myself. But Chris has beaten me to it. Chris wants to know if the pot made of spices is edible. <laughs> it is. There, when we take the pieces out of the printer, they're a little bit delicate. So we put um, like a resin or an epoxy on the exterior to make it strong. But if we didn't do that, yes, it would be edible. It would be really, really strong though. I think you would want to mix it with something starchy to dilute the, the spices, but yes, the binder that we use is mostly water with a little bit of alcohol in it. So it's, it's totally edible. And um, could the, the coffee, the coffee um, cups made out of the coffee flour, presumably they taste of coffee, do they, when you, when you, drink from them. They have a smell, but they also have a taste to them. Yes. So if you poured hot water in it, the coffee would dissolve and you could drink it. And yes, they're fragrant as well. So have you have you ever had a meal where you printed the, the, the crockery and the food as well and, and then consumed the whole lot of it? No, but that sounds like a fantastic idea. I would love to do that. <laughs> You didn't, you didn't experiment with printing food then as well, just the things that you use to serve food so far. I did print some chocolate once and um, it tasted okay. I think I would need to work with, with uh, someone like a chef, right? Who has a better sensibility for mixing ingredients than myself, but we could, we could print a meal. Sure. <laughs> and um, Iliada asks, which material do you use to bind the pulver to each other? I'm not sure which project they're talking about, but you talked about using water for the, for the spices projects. What, what else do you use to bind these ingredients together when you're printing? It's mostly water with just a little tiny bit of alcohol. And what does the alcohol do? It, it makes the, the water thinner so we can push it through the inkjet head. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's been really interesting talking to you. I hope thank you'll let us know about your next border wall incursion, but probably best to save it till after you've already done it rather than beforehand. <laughs> thank you so much, Marcus. It's been a pleasure. Good to speak to you and hope to get to meet you in the real world at some yep. point. That would be fantastic. Thanks a lot. Okay, bye. bye.